computer. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unstuff America. I'm here with Maya, and we are talking about You Are Not Your Stuff today, which is the first chapter of Unstuff Your Life, my book, which is available everywhere books are sold. It's not a plug for the book. It's just to tell you that it is so essential to getting and staying organized that it's where I start the book off so that it becomes a fundamental tool, even more than the organizational triangle, is understanding and being able to distinguish yourself from your belongings. And we get tremendous messaging every day that we are our stuff, that we are the clothes that we wear, the places we shop, where we live, uh, where we send our kids to school, who we're in a relationship with, uh, the cars we drive, all of those kinds of things, the, the electronics that we use, the phone we use, the books we read, the magazines we subscribe to, the websites we visit, the newspapers we seek out for information, all of it, that somehow the sum total of it defines who we are. And while on some level it might define who you are from people who are interested in judging you, it really has nothing to do with your fundamental value as a human being and the choices that you want to make and the values you want to live by. So the first thing one needs to do is really be able to separate yourself from the things. It's nice to have nice things if they serve you, but the pursuit of nice things at the expense of the things that really matter, which, as I often say, probably aren't even things at all, right. is telling. And we want to be mindful that living our values there will be no dissonance between our exterior world and our internal world if what we are doing is staying in alignment and in integrity with our values. There can be all kinds of dissonance between our interior world and our exterior world if what we're focused on is just rearranging the exterior world in a way to make it reflect something. Because we, we do run into the risk of getting into those 200 lies that we tell our, ourselves and other people about this is who I am because this is what I wear, where I live, how I travel through the world. And it's, it's a, I don't even want to say it's a slippery slope. I think it's a fundamental obstacle to getting and staying organized because your focus is not on the right things. Your focus is on rearranging your externals instead of stripping away everything that doesn't serve you, mm -hmm. whatever that is, right? I mean, if you're a minimalist, then it's pretty clear the journey that you have to paring yourself down. If you are not a minimalist, but you are somebody who wants to live right-sized and have just enough stuff around you that is going to serve you and nothing that's going to complicate or bog you down and prevent you from participating in life in the ways that you want to, that's going to require a little bit more discernment, right? I mean, in that all or nothing way of approaching things, if the idea is to make up an arbitrary number and say, I'm going to keep 20 things, whatever those are, that'll be a pot and a pan, a fork, a knife, a spoon, a plate, right. and then I can have garments and two books. Whatever, you know, however, however you're going to define that for yourself. If you are going to have some stuff, then what is some stuff and what is enough stuff and how are you going to decide whether it stays or it goes? It can't just be based on your feelings because your feelings will change just like your thoughts change. You'll have different thoughts. You could wake up in the morning thinking, oh, this is what I want to do today. And then by the end of the day, you could think, I don't want to do that at all. I want to do this. It's the same thing with your stuff. You could, you could wake up in the morning and say, I'm ready to get rid of this stapler. Right. Without it being based on, well... Do I have another stapler that I'm going to use? Do I actually not really staple things together? I actually have paper clip everything together or I fold down the edges of the pages and stick them together. I don't even need a stapler or paper clips, all of which is valid. I mean, so we're not getting into a quantification of stapler paper clips folding. Them. <laughs> not in this episode. Not in this episode. <laughs> we're just looking at, does the stapler serve you? Does it not serve you? So to what, how would you define for someone how something serves them. What does that mean? If you want like to break to think, that down. 
I like to think of comfort, convenience, and beauty. Does it make okay. your life more beautiful? Does it make your life more convenient? Really convenient when you think it all the way through, right? So recently I uh, explored making ice cream at home. I Ooh. thought that would be, I, I like ice cream. I eat yes, a lot of do. ice cream. And I <laughs> thought that perhaps a home ice cream maker would be economical. It would allow me to control the ingredients. And on paper, it sounded great. The reality of trying to make home ice cream, not for me. Tried yeah. it. Uh, made a delicious batch of black raspberry chocolate ice cream, although it was not as good as Grater's, but it was tasty. But uh, yeah, not a process that I'm interested in participating <laughs> in. So you just want to open a carton. I, you know, I don't want to just open a carton, but when we think about how I'm going to spend my time and what's important mm. to me, there are places I can buy ice cream where I have a sense of what's in the container. Right. And in the cost benefit analysis of how I want to spend my time, it's a better choice for me to purchase ice cream from somebody who really just likes to make ice cream and wants to make ice cream. That's all they want to do is make ice cream to sell to me and to other people like me. That's a better choice for me than to spend my time making ice cream because I'd rather be making this podcast. Right. And if the choice is making the podcast or making ice cream, it's a pretty easy thing. In the vacuum of not looking at the 24 hours in a day and how I'm going to spend that, it would be easy to think, oh, this could be a fun activity, right? Right. Me and my boyfriend, we can make ice cream and that'll be a togetherness activity and we'll, you know, we can shape the flavors. <laughs> the reality is it's a pain in the ass it's not easy it even with a fancy machine that is supposed to just put the ingredients in push the button and miraculously it freezes everything you don't have to do anything it, it wasn't my experience so, so in the vein of 200 lies in yeah. the vein of uh in the vein of it's not a bargain if you don't need it. How would you talk somebody through who's an impulse shopper? Let's say they go to the department store. There are all these sales happening. And it sounds like the issue is impulse control. It can be mm -hmm. in those moments where you look at something. So what are the steps that you take? It's, you just broke down some of the steps that you take as far as the ice cream maker. But someone who is in a store and sees a sale on t-shirts that they need or they think they need and they talk themselves into needing it or a bag when they have 25 bags at home. How do you talk somebody out of that process or what, what would you recommend to someone who said, you know, Shannon had this great bag and it looked gorgeous on her and everybody complimented her on it. Or, you know, John has this great power mower or John has this beautiful scarf that I saw at this party and everyone said this thing about, how do you get people to step out of that and that thought process when looking well, at stuff and acquiring stuff? What I would say is think it all the way through. You can completely appreciate the object in its natural environment, which is the department store or <laughs> where, online, wherever it is, you can say, wow, beautiful, what a cool thing. And then you can think, what am I gonna do with it? Where is it going to go? Is it replacing something that I already have? Is it augmenting something I already have? Which then brings us back to where's it going to go? Because if you've already determined where the home for the scarves are or where your lawn tools are and there's no room for a power mower or there's no room for another scarf, then you have to ask yourself, so is there something else that I use less frequently or that is less significantly promising that I would be willing to let go of to make room for this. It's a, it's, they are simple questions when we think about the inquiry. None of them require a lot of time, but you have to be willing to ask them and sit still just for the answer. So right. where's it going to go? What am I going to do with it? Mm -hmm. Do I need it or do I want it, right? I mean, is it, I, if it's not replacing something, the, the, simplest, the simplest way to approach that is if you're buying a new uh, toilet or a new sink because the last one is broken or a new faucet, that's pretty clearly a replacement. That's the third leg of the triangle, something in, something out. But if it's 
another now it's unlikely that that would be plumbing fixtures although it could be that you fetishize plumbing fixtures and you just buy a lot of them <laughs> but more often than not it would be a kitchen appliance it would be a yard tool it would be something right. that we would use in leisure time or it would be more clothing it might be books you might place a lot of value on books and reading but and if you already have a stack of books on your nightstand, aren't those books that you already committed to reading? So even though this is a great book that you want to read or it, it seems like it's the time to read the book now, I would ask you, is there another book that you already own that you're not going to read now? Or would it be possible to just park it in your queue at Amazon or someplace at the library and read it next? Not buy it now and then just stack it up around you. Each one of those questions, and then if we zoom back out to the theme of today, which is you are not your stuff, there's nobody that really cares about the books that are on your nightstand. The people who care don't matter because they're judging you all the time anyway, and you will always come up short in their estimation. I promise you, the people who are interested in judging you are seldom going to be favorable or forgiving in their assessment of you because the act of judging others is typically about trying to either either from a place of envy where you want to be them mm -hmm. or where you want to feel better about yourself by denigrating them and making them less than oh well I would never read that book I would never sleep with that person I'd never wear those shoes so it's one or the other. When we talk about those forks on the road, that's one of those forks is it's either because, oh, I want all of those things in the hopes that I get to then live their life or I, would, I don't want any of those things because I would never want anybody to think that I'm living their life. So it's, we split it in that, the road forks in those two directions. And ultimately, all of it is a colossal waste of time because that exercise of stuffiness, stuffness right. is distracting you and delaying you from living your values on a daily basis. Right. We love to talk about our values as if they are so important to us, but if we actually look at how we're spending our time, are we spending our time on the things that really matter or are we off in this busyness mm -hmm. of accumulation telling ourselves that somehow it's increasing the quality of our life, but if it brings us back to comfort, convenience, and beauty, does it make your life more beautiful? Great. Does it make your life more convenient? No. Then you get to decide, okay, well, I, my life is beautiful enough. This is going to inconvenience me. The beauty is outweighed by the convenience factor. Likewise, comfort. Is it really going to make your life comfortable, i.e. the ice cream machine, or mm -hmm. is it actually going to complicate your life? And it didn't take me long to figure it out. So it's a noble experiment. Case in point, I'm just like you. I am hardly perfect in my approach to the world. I will try something new and I'm, I'm susceptible to, to convenience and thinking, oh, this will be better. Because I, I certainly, I mean, I don't live on a farm. I don't have, you know, <laughs> I don't have access to, to milk and yeah. salt. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do one of those hand crank ice cream things. I live in an apartment in New York City. So right. I need something that's going to sit on my countertop. Well, where, where do people get, where do you find and all the people that you've helped people get stuck? Because my feeling is that it's comfort and beauty. So even if it's, nobody cares about the external, you may be somebody that never has anyone over, doesn't entertain, nobody sees what's on your bookshelves. Uh, and I know a lot of academics like this as well and i was in school for a long time so i have a lot of books and those books made me feel away even if nobody ever saw them they made me feel away they made me feel good that i looked at them and they were they made me happy sure so in my brain that serves me because when i look at those stacks of books it brings me some joy mm -hmm. uh when really i was a book hoarder. so <laughs> what <laughs> so how do you get people unstuck saying, well, I really don't give a shit what other people think about me. I really don't care. This is about me. This is about what makes me happy. You know, I have four different juice makers and those make me happy. I may not use them, but when I look at them, they make me happy. Yeah. You know, so right? I, like, <laughs> let's draw the line between your books in your library and four different juice makers. Yeah. And well, that's, that's only a bad because, example, but because that becomes much easier to dismantle. I'm going right. to say that 
Record. Pick the best juice maker and right. keep that one. And three of them can find new homes. When it comes to your books, if books are a value of yours mm -hmm. and there's room for them, you don't need to let them go. You only need to address it if the books are crowding out something else. If you live in a small apartment and you only have rooms for, for books or clothes and you don't want to be naked, you get to decide, okay, well, these are the minimum amounts of clothes that I can keep and not really touch my books much. Right. If I want more clothes, I'm going to have to sacrifice some books. So which books go? And it, it really, it comes back to, I think, a bigger value of how do you want to build a home, an office, an environment, a space for yourself? And what do you want to surround yourself with? There's no reason that you have to let books go just because you have a lot of them. Right. If there's room for them, it's only when there isn't room that it starts to raise the question of in the limited space, what serves me the best? I've mm -hmm. told many, many people who are visual artists, you don't need to have a living room with a sofa and a coffee table and a couple of chairs in it. If you don't do that kind of entertaining, turn your living room to a studio, paint in right. your living room, because then yep. you can paint every day. Sure. You don't need to go to a studio. You don't need to, be, you don't need to belabor the, the fact that, oh, I can't afford a separate studio, so I guess it means I can't paint. And in the meantime, you're not having dinner parties or cocktail parties where people are in your living room using your coffee table. Let, let them go. It's, you get to make the choices that serve you. I just want to make sure that those choices are based on your enduring values and not on narrative, not on story, not on feelings, but on math and fact. Well, that goes back to decluttering has become more a part of the conversation in recent years and people want to simplify because, you know, consumerism and everything else. So when talking about joy or feelings, because feelings is a huge part of you are not your stuff, yes. right? It's how people attach themselves to certain things and the saying of, you know, I, you may love your cell phone, but your cell phone doesn't love you, yep. right? So how do people step out of those feelings and really look at functionality of certain things? So it's, you talked about convenience being a part of it. So I would say that it's, it's not as much stepping out of the feelings hmm. as stepping into the values. Because I think if you're playing a feelings game with yourself, if you're trying to change how you feel about something, you're on a gerbil wheel of some kind because your feelings are going to keep changing and changing and changing. And as long as you're alive, you're going to feel things. So I don't know that you can freeze yourself in place once you get to the feeling that you like mm -hmm. and just stay there. So rather than trying to rearrange your feelings, I think let's just get out of that game and get into a different game, which is what is important to me regardless of how I feel. Let's make that the focus of the choices that I'm making today. So if what I want to do is be generous, be available, be more loving, uh, be more kind and thoughtful, and uh, be more thrifty. What are the choices that you need to make to make those a reality every day for yourself? It's going to be much easier to let that inform your decision making than how do I feel about that? Because you could think, well, I want to be generous, but I don't really want to give you the shirt off my back. I like this shirt. So mm -hmm. this shirt's not available. I'll, get, I'll go buy you another shirt because you're mm -hmm. naked, but you can't have mine. And I, I'm not advocating to, you don't have to give the shirt off your back, but the idea is if really you're cold, I'm warm and I can give you the shirt, then I can give you the shirt if that's what I'm doing is living my values. I can go buy another shirt as opposed to, well, it's not convenient for me to live my value right now of being generous because I'm having a feeling. I'll come back to my values when it's less inconvenient when it's, I'm not getting pulled on so much. You know, you can't have this shirt, but you can have a shirt. You'll be cold for a little while longer, but I'll run over to Walmart or Neiman's and I'll pick up something. I'll bring it back for you. You'll just be naked for a little bit longer and then we'll get you some clothes. So again, which is fine as long as you acknowledge that a little out of alignment with your values in that moment and a little more focused on your own comfort no judgment there. It's just worth recognizing 
how do you want to spend your day? And what I'm advocating for is it's much simpler if the day is built around the things that matter to you, because those will seldom create complications and bring things into your life that don't have utility and purpose. The superfluous stuff is going to come because of feelings, not because of values. So when you've been out in the field, yep. what's been, or maybe what's been your, the toughest client as far as convincing them that they are not their stuff? Have you had any experiences with people in the field where the, it's just, there's a resistance to s- separating themselves from maybe what they have too much of, whether, you know, they went on QVC and shopped yeah. every night. So they- what I would say is that... It, it, even with those folks, Mm -hmm. it's a values proposition. It's, I'm not going to disavow them of their story, the narrative that says that these things are important to them. They're, they're going to want to collect pens or buy more clothes than they can wear more cookware. That's not going to change in the sense that, there is no reasonable argument for somebody who's being unreasonable. Right. If we can send them back to their values and say, well, explain to me how this is actually helping you take care of your family and provide financially for their security because you're actually spending, you're spending their college fund or you're spending your retirement account on these things. And when it comes time to retire, I don't think another sweater set's going to make the difference between you staying in this apartment or not staying in this apartment, having the $112 in your retirement account will. Right. So sure. it's, it's about, it's always about sending folks back to their values and helping them to see that at any point you can pimp yourself and get yourself a, a day pass to live your feelings and not your values but you're going to have to pay it back at some point. So it's so shifting focus. It is exactly shifting It's shifting focus. focus or changing the lens on how you're looking at everything. Right. Because the mindset is I am my stuff and the new mindset is I'm not my stuff, I'm my values. And whatever this stuff is, if it's not serving me, doesn't need to be here. I where think do it's they, simple. Where do they start identifying those values so they can start shifting focus if you were to leave our and stuffers with anything what would it be as far as okay now i know i'm thinking about this i know i'm not my stuff right how do i find or how do i identify what my values are so i can keep on this path yeah so there's two things that they can do the simplest thing is they can go to unstuff university and download the free core value as ex- exercises that are in the library there it's absolutely free there's no there's no cost to joining you just Uh, put in your email address and your name and you have access to the library to all of the free tools that are there. So you can download the core value exercises there. If you don't want to do that, you can go online and do a Google search for core value exercises and you can download somebody else's. I would start there and set a timer for 30 to 45 minutes. Get yourself quiet, get something to drink, glass of water, cup of tea, cup of coffee probably not coffee. You don't want to be overly stimulated. (laughs) Uh, Maybe, maybe a glass of juice and just answer the questions. And that is the simplest, easiest way to clarify what is important to you and what isn't important to you. When we think about time management, which we'll cover in a future episode, urgent versus important is one of those breaking points. And the tension between the two of them is all about not knowing what's important, right? And in those moments, urgent will always trump important. So it's likewise, when we think about stuff versus values, if you don't know what's important to you, it will be very easy to wander through the mall with your credit card out, just bringing crap home. If you know what's important to you, it will be very easy to appreciate things in the world and say, so glad that this exists, don't need to own it. Do not need to bring it home. Happy it exists. It can stay where it is. I've got other things that I want to spend my time doing. And it's a, it's a learned behavior. It's a muscle that you're going to build over time. You're not going to do it perfectly the first time. But the more you practice that, the easier it will be. And, and when we think about the macro sense of joy and happiness on the planet, there's nothing that feels better 
in a lasting way than being in integrity with yourself and the things that matter to you. There, there's nothing complicated. There's nothing Sorry. sticky or, or pulley, draggy, upsetting about it. You can rest. I mean, even looking at, you know, um, give me liberty or give me death. The idea that when push comes to shove, the idea that I'd rather be in integrity and not here than out of integrity and here in a compromised, unhappy way. I think it's really important on the, then when we bring it back to the micro, that every time you pick up something, it's a very simple inquiry. Does it make my life more comfortable, convenient, or beautiful? If the answer is no to any of them, chances are you can leave it right where you found it. And with that, we're going to leave you. If you want to find out more about us and Unstuff America, you can visit www.andrewmellen, M-E-L-L-E-N.com. Any last words for everybody? Yes, we want to hear from you. So what do you think of our podcast? What do you think of what we're talking about? Do you agree? Do you disagree? You can also follow us on all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and tell us what you think because we do want to hear from you. Excellent. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you on another episode. Bye. Bye.